today I'm going to be talking you through the magical world of cloud security. So yeah, um, my name is Erica. Um, those of you who follow me on Twitter, I'm also Spatina. Um, and as you can tell by my t-shirt, um, I work for Zero. So at Zero, um, I'm a senior cloud security engineer. And what that basically means is that um, I work really closely with a lot of our developers and a lot of our product owners when it comes to um, making sure they can securely access and manage a lot of resources that impact their web applications or their um, you know, services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so today's talk is mainly going to be focused on um, different areas of cloud security that basically impact an application. Um, whether that, when or not this types of, type of tool or technology prevents something from happening or detects something from happening, um, either way, it's something that might be looking at a request before it gets to the application server, and it's just frankly something that developers need to know. Um, this talk is not exhaustive. I've got like 30-ish minutes. Um, so I kind of mainly focus this talk on things that over the past year of working with developers, some things that perhaps right at the get-go they didn't quite know or didn't quite understand, which is perfectly fine. Because if anyone in the room knows me, um, I love teaching and I love getting people to learn things and absorb things. Um, so a lot of this is about perhaps some of the, the stumbling blocks or the pitfalls that some developers I've worked with have come across. Um, and also just to, I'm not an expert. This is stuff from my point of view, from my experiences. So you know, there's probably def lots of other really good tooling and a lot of other good technology that I probably haven't heard of and I'm probably really keen to hear about. So feel free to ask questions at the end or to um, message me afterwards. Um, but yeah, so, so basically the days of your application and your services actually sitting on a server somewhere where you can actually reach it and touch it is kind of long gone. Um, and really, most of the stuff is moving to the cloud. Um, or for those of you who are Night Vale fans, like all knowing, almighty Glow Cloud that's constantly watching us. Um, but when it comes to cloud infrastructure, um, the responsibility is slowly starting to shift back to developers to be able to manage a lot of the tools and technologies that their requests might go through. So traditionally, you know, you might remote into a server and deploy your code and everything's fine and dandy. And when it comes to the actual hardware infrastructure, you know, such as the different types of um, networking scans that actually go, th go on, that might not have been something that a developer would have gotten involved in. Um, but when it comes to cloud infrastructure, most of the time you have access to all those tools and resources anyways. Um, and a lot of those tools and resources are built off um, code. So the infrastructure can actually be deployed with code. A lot of the tools and technology are deployed with code. So really the next best person to be managing these things are going to be developers. So um, either way, the, the, the thing is that's important is to understand what is out there um, at each of the different levels. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna be talking through the different worlds, um, like Mario. Thought I'd go with the theme. Um, and kind of taking you through different types of aspects from the host level, the platform level, and then the everything else um, to kind of really understand um, all the things you need to know. And perhaps maybe bring something back to your teams um, because everyone's architecture is going to be different um, and no one's is perfect and everything can always be improved. So, um, which is actually, when I found out that the OWASP got updated a few weeks ago, I was like, yes, <laughs> um, kind of, because also the wording of this new update is a bit foggy. But um, the one of the newest updates to OWASP um, this year for the 2017 is um, insufficient attack protection. So I know there's a lot of um, discussions that have been going on whether or not this new, um, this new A7 has been worded properly. Perhaps it's a bit too expansive. You know, it seems to be relying a lot on technology to be doing a lot of the things. Um, so I know people have a lot of opinions and I would love to hear people's opinions, um, but that's not what we're gonna really talk about today. What I'll probably talk about today are different tools and technologies that can help you be able to um, detect and prevent um, when things might go wrong um, and stuff that kind of relates directly back to A7. So uh, the first world that we're gonna be going through is going to be host level security. So kind of starting down at the very low level. So this can be things like the application server that your um, service is running on or perhaps you know the serverless infrastructure that it's, it's going to be run on or um, different types of um, API entry and gateway endpoints. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is, is keeping secrets. Um, so most services that run, they need to have secrets, whether or not that's um, an access key and a secret key to be able to run other services or call other APIs or API keys. Either way, you're going to need these. Um, and actually, 
<laughs> funny enough, there's lots of, well, not funny enough, not really funny at all. Uh, there's lots of tools out there that are made for actually automatically scanning and going through all sorts of things online to actually find when people accidentally commit to these type of things. So if you're using secret keys and you're using uh, API keys and, and whatnot and you're committing them somewhere or pasting them anywhere and making them available, chances are people are gonna find them. Um, so there's a better way to do this. Um, most cloud service providers already provide you a lot of great tooling if you're going with some of the bigger ones. So for example, with AWS, there's things like Parameter Store or with Azure, there's Key Vault. And what that basically does, it's, it's a way for you to control and set access controls and be able to encrypt those secrets so the only thing that needs them is the actual services you're creating. Um, however, if you're not going with one of the fancy, if you don't have one of the big fancy cloud service providers or perhaps you're working on an individual project on working on things like Google Cloud and stuff, um, it's really quite easy if you just kind of in a sense, you really two things, you're storing those keys and you're encrypting them in a, store, in a storage location that has proper access controls. So access controls, which we'll kind of get on a bit later, are super vital. Um, really following the rule of least privilege, what level of access do I really need to only do what it needs to do? Um, so making sure those two things are in place um, are really important when you're storing your secrets. So now that you've stored your secrets, you created your service, um, it's now time to manage the way people actually authenticate to that service or perhaps how you can actually access the infrastructure that the service runs on, which leads us to multi-factor authentication. Um, so just a show of hands, just out of curiosity, how many people at your current work actually use multi-factor authentication for accessing servers or services? Yes, awesome, so cool. Um, so yeah, multi-factor authentication, for those of you who haven't come across it before, or MFA or 2FA or all the crazy acronyms for two-factor, um, it's basically a method to prove who you are aside from having a password. So it could be something physically that you have. So those of you who perhaps are what used to work for old companies, cough, cough, where I used to work and you had an RSA token. Um, so something physical with a one-time password that will automatically refresh. Or nowadays, a lot of you are probably familiar with applications that you have on your phone that will have a one-time password or perhaps even a push notification service. So, so these are important because passwords, frankly, are pretty crap. Um, people don't manage them very well. Setting more policies and rules on how you should manage them is just not going to work. Um, some of your end users that perhaps aren't as technically savvy might constantly read you the password just to get back to the previous password they had before, or they'll just tack on like password one, password two, password three, and it's just not, it doesn't work. Um, especially it doesn't work if any of you guys follow um, the credential jump dumps that happen with people using the same password over multiple services, and perhaps using that same password for personal things and work things, it's like, Bad news bears, it's not a good idea. Um, so having a second factor, particularly on sensitive areas. Um, so this could be things such as if you had an admin console that needed to be exposed on the internet. Having that sec second factor authentication is very important because it proves that someone needs to have a password plus needs to have something physical in order to confirm who they are. Um, but not only that, but also adding two-factor authentication to the actual servers that support your application. So if you need to connect into your server, um, having to type in you know, using a username and password, but then also having to authenticate um, is very important. Um, so in terms of other services you can use, um, I'm not going to be promoting any vendors um, today, but there are a lot of really good open source projects that you can simply use online. So there's Privacy Idea, so they do a lot of um, 2FA services using things like uh, one-time passwords as well as hardware tokens. Um, and there's also um, Google Authenticator. They've got a, a public repo for actually integrating um, Google Authenticator into your applications. Um, or you can just do an easy search online. A lot of um, multi-factor authentication providers actually have free services. So if you're working on a small project um, and still want to keep security in mind, um, a lot of these companies also have free services that you can use so long as you stay within a certain threshold. So, and just keep in mind, not all 2FAs are the same. So if you kind of follow along the news, um, you know, SMS-based two-factor authentication is not so secure. So using things that require a push notification to your phone or perhaps a one-time password um, is probably the better way to go. Cool. So next we've got um, TSL certificates and decrypting traffic. So, um, and which, which is going to be related to this area and the next one that's going to follow. Um, but really, 
having your website, having a certificate on your website is important because otherwise without it, people can kind of, in a sense, it have the ability to watch the traffic as it passes through. And frankly, it's, it's easy. Like, even I've done it, like in using Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt is a free TLS certificate service. Um, it allows you to create your own certificate. Um, and it's actually, they've got a lot of helpful guides online for being able to produce those as well. Um, and it's free, which is fantastic. Um, so given that these services are so widely available, it's really silly not to have um, certificates on all of the services and web applications that you use, even if they are just internal. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind, the lower the level you decrypt your traffic um, is important. So for example, if you've got, if your requests are coming from a client and into your, uh, your infrastructure, and you decrypt that traffic right on the outset, you have to really think whether or not that traffic should be re-encrypted from that point, and then re-encrypted all the way through to your application server. So every team is gonna be doing it differently. Some people might trust the inside of their network and think that decrypting it on the outside is fine because we've got plenty of controls to prevent someone from getting in. Um, but as we'll kind of discuss later, there's a lot of newer cloud architecture models that kind of are based off trustless networks. So um, it's just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, yeah, and also in terms of when it comes to certificates, um, I'm honestly no expert, um, but there's a really good OWASP uh, TLS cheat sheet that kind of explains to you um, the best ciphers to use, the best protocols to use, uh, the best key size, et cetera. Um, so definitely follow their advice when it comes to that stuff. And all of these links and stuff I'll try and make available as best as I can. And then lastly, when it comes to host-based authentication, the next thing is just host-based monitoring. So this can be one of two different things. Um, it could either be a gateway that sits right outside of your application server that is looking at all of the traffic before it goes through, or it could be as simple as um, an agent that is sitting on your server itself that kind of, in a sense, phones back to a manager every time it receives information. So um, you can go with one of these two models. Um, there are so also some really good um, open source host-based intrusion systems through OSSSEC. So that's something, um, if you're interested in kind of learning a bit more, perhaps if your company doesn't use them, um, kind of using their tools and understanding how it works is usually a really good way to understand. Um, but this is important because when, by monitoring on the host, it kind of leads back to that preventing attacks, right? So this can check, these agents can check for things like um, when certain uh, system files are modified and you didn't expect them to be modified, or perhaps um, different system events and different types of access that occurs on the OS level that you didn't expect to happen. Um, or it could even be something like outdated um, patch versions on the software that you use. So this is really important because our servers are constantly having to feed back out to the internet to pull down packages and libraries to actually keep your code running. So making sure you have some type of protection on those hosts to make sure that if you run a script or you download a bad package that goes AWOL, you have a way of detecting that something goes wrong. Um, but on the downside, kind of thinking back to TLS certificates, if you have to decrypt the traffic before going into that application server, um, you know, whether or not you want to re-encrypt it from that gateway into your application server is kind of, I guess as Kate would say, a business decision. Um, so yeah. But that, that's, that's the end of host-based monitoring. So now we're kind of going into the next level above that. So in cloud infrastructure, you have really what is a network. So you've got a private cloud network, but you can have ton of those, like you can have hundreds if you wanted. Um, so going into the next world is kind of more focused on platform level security. So this is, this is focused now on the overall platform that all of your networks sit on. So this would be your whole cloud infrastructure environment. Um, so yeah, so it, and this kind of covers the things for when you have multiple networks that are connected to each other, um, that are doing different things, and only maybe some of those networks are connected to the internet, but other networks shouldn't be. Um, so it kind of brings those all together. And the first thing that we're going to be going through is going to be access. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with the rule of least privilege, and it's really, it's actually probably the biggest problem that we have when it comes to most of our cloud infrastructure attacks or hacks or whatnot. So if you watch the, the talks from Rich Jones from um, CCC, he did a really great talk on gone in 60 milliseconds and how he was able to use access controls and Lambda in order to escalate and get access to other components of an AWS infrastructure. 
Um, and then Daniel, um, whose last name I can't pronounce, um, did a, a phenomenal talk at KiwiCon, but he does a lot of blog posts about how to actually um, exploit things in AWS once you've actually gotten access. But the key point of both of these talks really truly lies on just bad access control. Um, if you were to go onto any forum and were to look up, oh, what should my access controls be for this storage device or for this or for my lambdas, um, a lot of the times people will just do any, 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 any just to get it to work, um, which is bad. <laughs> so there's a lot of other really handy tools out there as well, such as Cloudsploit. So Cloudsploit is something that um, recently came out probably about a few months ago, but it goes through and it does a security check of all of the API calls that happen in your actual um, platform. So this could be checking for things such as, you know, maybe you've got one role or one user that really doesn't need to change access because it strictly should only have access to do get requests to a certain storage device. But maybe someone got access to your platform and all of a sudden was managed to, or someone mistakenly give, gave it access to do other things as well. Um, things like CloudSplit can alert you on different types of security policies when things change, such as your access controls, um, but as well as a suite of a bunch of other things. So identity and access controls is, is something that's probably <coughs> the hardest um, thing to control in cloud infrastructure. Um, and it really kind of, it's really the, the pinpoint for the way cloud infrastructure architectures are going forward. So those of you who kind of heard of Beyond Corp that recently came out probably last year, um, Beyond Corp is a, a trustless based network. So it doesn't rely on having like a perimeter and then you know, everything else on the inside is just you know, delicious unencrypted goodness that anyone can access. Um, it actually, it, it does not trust the user and in a, in, instead you give the user certain trust rights to be able to access certain information. Um, and also requiring certain levels of authentication based off what they're accessing. So perhaps if you're accessing your payroll data, maybe that only requires your name and username, but if you're gonna be accessing like, um, I don't know, customer data or a server that contains customer data, you'd have to do also a push notification on your phone. So it kind of like steps up and, but the underpinning um, importance of it is really just access controls and making sure you're doing that right, which based off the talks that have been given recently, on um, hacking cloud infrastructure. Um, most teams don't do it well. So then going on next is um, system log monitoring, and then the next one is going to be more security log monitoring. So this, this, these two areas really hit home to the whole new A7 um, OWASP with uh, attack prevention. Um, and really a lot of these system logs that are produced from all of the technologies and tools that you have, so you know, if you've got all your, like, your logs and all of your firewall logs and all of the you know cloud trail stuff to see what users are doing in your environment um, it's really only useful once it's aggregated because I can't tell you how fun it is to be logged into multiple things to try and correlate information when logs aren't shipped to a central place it's a pain in the ass um, so what's what's important about system log is actually getting it all into one source so you can actually see when things are going wrong a lot of these tools are actually, and this is basically for those of you who are familiar with like security information and event um, systems or management systems like Seams or log management tools, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. But really all of those logs really rely on three things. You need data collection, so you need to actually get the data that you need to actually look at. You need a way to search that data, and you need to actually visualize that data. So it really, there's a lot of really great open source projects that rely on things like Elasticsearch, Log Search, and Kibana boards that will put all of that information together for you. So there's products like Graylog, which is an open source project um, that that can do that for you. Um, of course, like taking care of an open source project and stuff. But um, aside from like giving a buttload of money to Steam providers, um, but this is really handy because if you can see that perhaps um, you notice your application server is starting to drop a lot of requests and you're starting to get a lot of 500s. And you also notice that, you know, perhaps the CPU for a lot of the gateways it passes through is getting really, really hot, and those appliances are starting to fall over. And you notice a spike in traffic from your log intrusion um, system saying, you know, these IP addresses are just going nuts. Um, you can kind of piece those together and kind of tell that you've got a bigger problem than just by looking at those three things in silos. And perhaps even, it also helps you so you don't miss anything either. Because if you're only looking at the fact that you're dropping requests, um, you would really have no idea that it's due to the fact that 
you know, the same IP addresses are pinging you and perhaps trying to do, in a sense, a denial of service attack. Cool. And then um, on the other side of that is the, you know, the security monitoring aspect. So not just the performance of the infrastructure that you rely on to get your requests from the client to your app server, but also the security policies and rules that are triggered um, when that request comes through. So this can be um, things that, you know, decrypt, inspect, apply security policies and rules, and proxy that traffic on from a gateway appliance down to your app server. Um, so this, this, is, this is technology like, you know, a web application firewall or an intrusion detection, detection device um, or an application and network filtering device. So all of these things will kind of um, allow you to see a lot of that information and will produce logs that show that. Um, but kind of going back to the earlier point on TLS certificates, this requires those devices to actually see that traffic coming through. So it, it depends on actually making sure these devices are secured and that they have proper access control so not everyone can just log into a gateway and see the traffic as it comes through. Um, perhaps re-encrypting the traffic after it leaves if you, if, if you don't want a trusted network. Um, and also making sure that those logs are in a secure place as well because it's gonna have a lot of pretty important information, um, especially if you know, you're capturing and you're not filtering out any sensitive data. Um, but again, there's no perfect method for doing any of this. Um, it really kind of it depends, kind of more on the consultant responses. It depends on what your business needs and what you actually need to see. Um, but yeah, so and, and another thing about this is that when it comes to these pieces of technology, it is super important to start from the bottom with your security rules and policies and build up. Because um, there is no such thing as a web application firewall that will fix all of your security issues or fix all of your code issues and stop all of the SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, it's, it doesn't happen. Like for those of you who actually know how to do a SQL injection attack or a cross-site scripting attack, um, it's easy to also have that appear to be like a normal user request and perhaps you know sending through a request that says select, my company's name is select credit union and then your WAF goes, oh my god. Um, so it's, it takes a lot of love and care and tuning to take care of a lot of these things. Um, so there's no such thing as a magical piece of technology that can be plugged in and fix all your problems. Um, so it's really important to really start with the bare bones of what these tools actually do and build it up from there. Um, and also being careful of when you're applying security rules and policies that should be temporary. So perhaps um, a virtual patch, you know, perhaps there's a vulnerability that you found in your code that you can't quite fix yet and you're gonna put a security policy in place to stop that from happening at a higher level, making sure you actually go back and reassess that to make sure that it's going to be removed eventually, because otherwise you're gonna get like a, like a colossus like thing of security policies and no one's gonna understand where they came from. So um, really properly taking care of this information. So it's really a trade-off. Um, you know, do we really need to see this information? Can we properly take care of it? Because if the information it's producing is garbage, or if the data it's producing is garbage, the information you're getting from it is also garbage. So can, can we properly take care of this? Or is it something that we could perhaps use other things like host-based monitoring to make a lot of the assumptions that we're seeing? Um, and then we're getting to the last world, um, which I'm actually gonna double check. 155, okay, cool. Um, so the last world is around other people's networks. So. Um, this is basically when your, when your requests go through someone else's network before getting to your own cloud infrastructure. So this is something that a lot of you probably understand um, as like, such as a content distribution network. So there's a lot of vendors out there that a lot of people are probably familiar with, such as like Cloudflare or Akamai, because um, those are two of the largest. But what these, what these networks do is that you're trusting them with your data and you're trusting them with your requests and you're trusting that they're securing it in order to get the benefit of security um, and the benefit of performance. Because a content distribution networks by having you know, a bunch of points of presence or a bunch of pops throughout the world that will receive requests, will kind of spread the load out, um, they can offload a lot of the requests that can just be served from those pop locations, um, or they'll just send the whole request through to your cloud infrastructure. So it allows you to improve your performance because if there's a lot of content that you don't need to go back to your, your, your cloud infrastructure for, and the, the content distribution networks can take care of it, but you really, it comes into the whole shared responsibility model that you're trusting, you're trusting these vendors and these products to actually protect your data because you really have no control over how they do it. Um, because you're, you're trusting that they're going to secure their cloud um, network 
and you're responsible for securing the data and the information that you put in that cloud. So it's really, you've kind of got to um, trust them to do it right. So this is a step up for those of you who might be familiar with like CDN um, networks for improving things like performance of frameworks and libraries. So the stuff that like Google does and JavaScript does. Um, so this is a step up from that. This is actually handling your client requests as they come through to your cloud infrastructure. So um, yeah, again, it's just a lot of trust um, in someone else to handle the security for you. Um, but there is certain, a certain level that you are responsible for as well. Um, so I guess the final, the final run to the, you know, the flagpole and Mario. Um, I mean, that's, this is really all I can really cover for today. Again, um, I only have 30 minutes to kind of take you through a bit of cloud security. Um, so hopefully you all have a better understanding of, of what it really means because, you know, I know it's a very buzzy word, um, but ultimately it comes down to um, protecting the data, protecting applications, and protecting the infrastructure that exists in a cloud infrastructure environment. Um, so if there's anything I ask for you all to take away from today, um, is that if there's something interesting, if there's something cool that you saw today that you're like, oh, that's so neat, I've never heard of that before and I wanna like, do more cool things with it. Um, a lot of these projects that I've linked to you today are open source on GitHub, so you can go check it out, see how they work. You can um, you know, run your own projects to try and use them yourself, and you can also contribute um, if you're so inclined. But also, um, Hopefully, I hope a lot of you that operate perhaps in a cloud infrastructure or have projects that run out of cloud infrastructure, um, hopefully you go back to you know, your projects and you try to learn more about how your architecture actually works. Because like I said, everyone's is very different. Um, you provide input to your teams. Um, not every company is going to have um, a cloud security engineer who's going to help them with that. A lot of the times those decisions might be from other people and other developers. Um, so definitely speak up and mention some things that you think might be helpful for you. Um, and of course, there's, there's no magical solution and no magical technology or tool that will help um, orphaned or outdated or technical debt. Um, you know, there are some devices that can be very helpful when it comes to you know, virtually patching something, which is what A7, and the A7 and OWASP is kind of hinting at. But um, you, know, you, can't, you can't put that patch in there forever. And you can't hope that you know, SQL injection and all these other web attacks will get stopped at that layer because it's just, it's frankly not possible. Um, and then of course, um, probably one of the biggest struggles I think most developers have is that there's a lot of really great security tooling and security, security, security technology that they would love to get their hands on. But perhaps a lot of companies are more focused on providing features or stuff for the actual code that their company runs on. So. Um, all I can really say is that ref, um, refactoring your code that already exists is probably just as good as writing a whole new feature because it allows you to get a lot more visibility over other areas and allows you to use other security um, you know, monitoring tools to actually understand what's going on because if, if your code is causing a lot of false positives to start popping up all over the place or perhaps you do things in a way that causes a lot of security errors to pop up in the first place, um, it's not really gonna be that helpful. So. Um, you know, you can tell them that Erica from OWASP said that refactoring your code is just as good as features. Um, and that should buy you enough credibility, um, hopefully. Um, not really. Um, but anyways, that's, that's my talk for today. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask.